Hello, this is Music Tech Help Guy, and welcome to episode 3 of my Logic Pro 10 video series. In this video, we'll be taking a look at some of the things that we've got to do uh, to set up for recording, some of the things we have to do prior to uh, recording our session. So we'll talk about bit depth, sample rate, what those are and how to set them up, and we'll also talk about I.O. buffer and how that affects our recording. In previous videos, we used audio tracks and software instrument tracks. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the guitar or bass track, which is essentially identical to an audio track. Uh, and all it does is it opens up an audio track with a channel strip setting preloaded to it. And then you can choose a guitar uh, amp designer or bass designer channel strip setting uh, from the library on the left. So after you create your guitar bass track, um, the default setting that you get is just kind of a Vox emulating uh, British clean setting. And you may be wondering um, where the channel strips go, where the inspector go. Um, if you just click on the inspector tab, that'll show up. And you can also hide and show uh, the amp library just by clicking here. So you can have both up at once. And again, if you just click on the little triangle there, it closes it. Now, if you prefer, you can still go down to your uh, channel strip settings under Legacy Logic Electric Guitar, and you can choose your amp settings from here if you uh, don't want to use the amp library on the left. So I'm going to go ahead and close out my library, and let's talk about some different things that we need to set up before we start recording. The two main factors of digital audio that affect the quality of the files that we record are your sample rate and your bit depth. And it's important to set these before you start recording. So let's set our sample rate first by going up to File, going down to Project Settings, and then to Audio. So you can see here that our default sample rate is set to 44.1 kilohertz. And essentially what the sample rate controls is the number of samples taken per second during the analog to digital conversion process. So keep in mind that the signal coming from your microphone or from like an instrument like a guitar or bass is actually an analog signal, which means that it's just an electrical voltage. So what your audio interface does is it takes that voltage and converts it to digital, converts it to binary, basically ones and zeros, by sampling it at regular intervals per second. So in this case, with 44.1 kilohertz, uh, it's the same thing as 44,100 hertz. So it means that the interface would be sampling at 44,100 times per second. From a quality standpoint, the higher your sample rate, the higher the frequency range of your recording. So high-pitched instruments like crash cymbals, high squealy guitar solos, and high synthesizers will benefit from a higher sample rate. But that doesn't always mean you want to use an ultra-high sample rate like 192 because that's also going to result in a really large file size. So I'll typically use something between 48 and 96 for most uh, music recordings. Based on what sample rate you choose, it's actually pretty easy to figure out what the highest frequency your sample rate can support is. The Nyquist-Shannon theorem, also known as the Nyquist sampling theorem or just the Nyquist theorem, states that your sample rate has to be two times the highest frequency that you're trying to capture. The way I like to describe it is just take your sample rate, divide it in half, and that will give you the highest frequency that your recording can accurately reproduce. So for instance, if we're using a sample rate of 44,100, if you divide that in half, you get 22,050 hertz. So at 44.1, the highest frequency you can accurately reproduce is 22,050 hertz. The outer extremes of human hearing are from about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Although not too many people can hear below about 35 hertz and not too many people can hear above 18,000 hertz. So you might be asking, if a sample rate of 44,100 can reproduce 22,050, what's the point of using a higher sample rate? Well, when you use a higher sample rate, not only are your most extreme upper frequencies crisper and clearer, so are your mid-highs, so are your mid-range frequencies, because they are resampled more accurately than at a lower sample rate. So there is an advantage to using a higher sample rate, like 48, 88, or 96. But keep in mind that the higher your sample rate, the larger your file size is going to be. Another thing to consider is called foldover or aliasing. 
What aliasing is, is when upper harmonics in a recording pass what your Nyquist frequency is. So let's say I'm recording like a piccolo or a flute, like a really high pitched instrument, and its upper overtones pass the threshold of 22,050 hertz at a sample rate of 44,100. When that happens, those extra frequencies have to go somewhere in the digital uh, reproduction of the waveform. So what happens is those overtones fold back down onto the recording at inharmonic intervals, causing uh, dissonance in the upper frequencies and cause the upper frequencies to not be as clear as they otherwise could be. So the way you can avoid this is just use a higher sample rate so it increases your maximum frequency threshold. So, for example, if we use the sample rate of like 96, um, if you divide 96,000 in half, you get 48,000 hertz. And so that means the highest frequency that 96K can reproduce is 48,000 hertz, which is pretty high. That's well above our threshold of human hearing. So even if the flute or the piccolo or whatever high-pitched instrument you're trying to record, even if that instrument has really high overtones like 25,000, 30,000, so those overtones are still well below the 48,000 hertz barrier, and we won't have to worry about getting aliasing noise. Next, let's set up our bit depth. And the way we get to bit depth is you go to Preferences Audio. This is the same place where we uh, set up our I.O. device uh, in Episode 1. And it's the same place we set up our buffer in Episode 1. But down here toward the middle of the uh, screen, you can see uh, there's a checkbox. And right next to it says 24-bit recording. Logic supports two different bit depths, 24-bit and 16-bit. And when you uncheck this option, uh, you're lowering the resolution of your recording to 16-bit rather than using 24-bit. Now, your bit depth is the number of bits of information taken per sample during the analog to digital conversion process. So, for example, if you recorded a sample rate of 44.1, each of those 44,100 samples per second will hold a 16-bit or 24-bit binary word, and a binary word is just a collection of ones and zeros. So for 16-bit, it would be 16 ones and zeros, and for 24-bit, the word would have 24 ones or zeros. Now the way most people describe bit depth is that the higher your bit depth, the wider your dynamic range, or the higher your mix headroom. A lot of people will also say the higher your bit depth, the louder your recording can be. And that's not entirely untrue, but we should really think about it as kind of a top-down perspective rather than a bottom-up, uh, vol how much volume can I get perspective. Essentially, your bit depth controls the dynamic range between your line level and your noise floor. And noise floor is exactly what it sounds like. It's a floor of noise. Basically, at very, very quiet levels in all digital and analog recordings, there is a very quiet level of uh, noise in the recording that you typically don't hear uh, because it's so quiet. Although on tape, it's pretty easy to hear. So the advantage of having a lower noise floor is that when you add uh, dynamic processing like compressors and limiters and mastering limiters to bump up the volume of your recording... Not only are you bumping up the volume of the recording on the track, you're also bumping up the noise floor. And so if it's compressed too much and squashed too much, you'll actually start to hear the hiss and hum in the background of the noise floor. Another thing that results from a lower noise floor is the ability to record at quieter dynamics with a better, cleaner result without hearing the hiss in the background. So very subtle recordings that have really quiet passages like classical music, um, a way to alleviate the hiss in the recording is to use a higher bit depth, which lowers the noise floor. So at a 16-bit recording, your noise floor is at negative 96 dB, and at 24-bit, your noise floor is at negative 144 dB. So what that does is it gives you a little bit more range to squash and compress a recording and then bump the gain up on it without uh, raising the noise floor along with it or without noticeably raising the noise floor along with it. Now that we've got sample rate and bit depth out of the way, let's talk about one other factor that we have to take into consideration before recording. Uh, let's talk about our I.O. buffer size. And the I.O. buffer is uh, located in the same uh, window where we set our bit depth before. It's just uh, preferences audio. 
Now, your I.O. buffer uh, has nothing to do with the quality of your recording. What it has to do with is how your processor handles information, how fast it can handle that information, and uh, how large of chunks it handles that information. So when you're working with a low buffer like 32 or 64, your processor is handling information very quickly in very small chunks. This takes a lot of system resources to do this, and it's pretty strenuous on your processor. When you use a higher value like 1024 or 512, the processor is processing things slower but in larger chunks, so it's less strenuous on your processor. The advantage of a higher buffer size is that it's less strenuous on your processor, and as a result, you can use more simultaneous mix plugins. So this is optimal for mixing, mastering, even editing and playback. If you're trying to run too many plugins uh, simultaneously at a lower buffer size, what will happen is sometimes uh, your playback will stop and Logic will give you an error message. The disadvantage of using a higher buffer is that it causes more latency issues. So you never want to use it for recording because, well, your singer or your player can feel like they're out of time or what they're hearing, uh, what they're monitoring is out of time with the metronome. Um, so you never want to use this for, for recording. The advantage of using a lower buffer size is that you're optimizing your latency, sometimes down to five or six milliseconds. So you always want to use a low buffer size for recording. And of course, the disadvantage, like I said before, is that you can't use as many mix plugins simultaneously, and it makes your processor work harder. So you pretty much always just want to use uh, a lower buffer size for recording and use a higher buffer size when you're mixing, mastering, or even just playing back audio with a lot of plugins. After you set your buffer size, Logic will actually tell you what the resulting latency is depending on what buffer you chose. So for this, I'm going to choose 32 samples, and it shows that I have approximately 6 milliseconds of round trip latency. And that's pretty good considering that the human ear is not really going to be able to, to tell that there's any latency. So next, let's go under the general tab. And another thing you can set up here is you can uh, set up uh, what recording file type you want. By default, um, Logic uses AIFF, which is essentially Apple's version of a WAV file, but you can also choose WAV, and you can also choose CAF, which is Core Audio Format. All three of these formats are uncompressed uh, formats, so they can hold any sample rate or any bit depth combination. So the only thing we really have to do now is uh, turn off input monitoring, and then turn on ARM for recording, so we can hit R to record. And one last thing just to check is just to make sure that the input path uh, for the track matches up. So if you go to your channel strip here, you can see the input path uh, from your interface. So right now it's set to input one. So all that means is I got to make sure that my guitar is plugged into input one on my interface and I should be ready to record. In the next episode, we'll talk about recording techniques in Logic and we'll put some of these preparatory things we did in this video to good use. So I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks again for watching.